I got a vaccine joke for you guys, but half of you won't get it. Now, speaking of not getting vaccinated, today's topic: vaccine mandates. They're currently constitutional. Now, this isn't just me trying to be edgy in the nerdiest of ways. Let's stick it to the boomers and shoot up some Pfizer vaccine behind the Safeway. Instead, this lukewarm take comes from a 1905 Supreme Court case that is yet to be overturned. Now, if you disagree with this legal interpretation, take it up with Kavanaugh or the 1905 Supreme Court. Let's not shoot the messenger here in the comments section. Enter Jacobson v. Massachusetts. The year was 1905. Teddy Roosevelt was just settling into his first elected term in office, and smallpox was a much bigger problem than its name would suggest. Good news, though, we now have a vaccine. Bad news? Well, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink it, unless Massachusetts implemented a program where you could either get the vaccine or pay a five-dollar fine. Now, this mandate did not sit well with Henning Jacobson, the OG anti-vaxer. He was doing it before it was cool. Now, he declined Massachusetts's free vaccine and got hit with that five-dollar fine. Instead of paying it, he sued the state of Massachusetts, and much, much more than five dollars worth of legal fees later, it got appealed to the Supreme Court. Now, this brings us to today's question. Can a state force people to get a vaccine? Unlike most of the cases I cover in Supreme Court episodes, there was no clear law or precedent to be applied here. It was more the brightest legal minds of a generation trying to improv their way to a conclusion based on their understanding of the Constitution. Are mandatory vaccines legal? Yeah, and、uh, feel free to jump in at any time, guys. Now, because their posterior removal approach to answering this question is a bit unorthodox for the show, this episode is going to be set up a bit differently from normal. The Supreme Court started with a bold thesis statement and then worked backward to carve out specific venues for challenging a potential overreaching public health law. So first, what was that big idea? Well, the decision's opening statement was even more the final nail in an anti-vaxxer's coffin than a new variant. The majority wrote, "In every well-ordered society charged with the duty of conserving the safety of its members, the rights of the individual in respect of his liberty may, at times, under pressure of great dangers, be subjected to such restraint." To be enforced by reasonable regulations, as the safety of the general public may demand. Now, translating that from legalese to English, the idea was: Hey, guys, if there's a public health emergency threatening the lives and liberty of everyone, well, the state can take reasonable measures in restricting the rights of the individuals. Now, of course, that alone is an incredibly vague statement. <clears throat> Your Honor. The court said that we can restrict liberties for public health purposes, so we're doing mandatory bleach injections to fight this thing. Kill the host, and you kill the virus. Now the court spent the remainder of their decision paring back that bold statement that I just read to you into a legal theory that could be challenged in court if someone got a bit too crazy with their public health solutions. Now this walkback can be split into two categories. First, is this a, an emergency public health solution? And second, is this a reasonable public health solution? Now, the first major obstacle to the court's broad statement that during a public health emergency, a state can infringe on an individual's rights was just a whole bunch of previous public health measures that were rejected by lower courts. Take for example, for the sake of public health, you can no longer make cigars in tenement houses, give away articles in connection with food sales, or, as a baker, force an employee to work more than ten hours a day. Now, the states had previously justified those laws under the compelling interest of public health emergencies, and the courts looked into them and found that that justification just wasn't there. It was a state legislature equivalent of, "Hey, I read Playboy for the articles." Yeah, sure. 
I just want to end the constitutionally protected practice of shops offering rewards for buying their food because of public health concerns. Now, these laws were found to be unconstitutional because the legislature of a state cannot enact laws prohibiting harmless acts not concerning the health, safety, or welfare of society. Today, the Jennings lawyers were trying to tie these mandatory vaccine laws to those sinking ships. Their argument was simply, hey, not getting vaccinated is harmless from a societal perspective. It only really potentially hurts the person who's refusing to get vaccinated. Now, unfortunately for them, the court disagreed, finding that, unlike in the previous cases I just mentioned, the statute in the present case was enacted as a health measure and has a real and substantial relation to that object. Vaccines were an effective tool in fighting smallpox, and they were being widely used across the country. It's no real stretch of the imagination to say that mandating those vaccines, well, that's indisputably a public health move. Now to the more important question most of you are probably asking yourselves right now, is this mandate a reasonable public health move? Now to answer this question, the Supreme Court gave citizens the classic don't ask me, ask your mom. If the state legislature says a public health law is good or bad, well, we're probably going to agree with them. As they put it, the legislature has large discretion to determine what personal sacrifice the public health, morals, and safety require from individuals. If you don't like what your state's doing, you can either vote, move, or tough it out. Still, the courts didn't want to be left entirely out of the conversation. They crafted three different venues in which a public health law could be found unreasonable, if it's arbitrary, oppressive, or cruel and inhumane. First, arbitrary laws. Now, these relate to singling out specific groups in public health rules. Well, smallpox is running wild again. All those dirty Italians have to stay at home until we get a lid on this thing. Recently, there have been a few successful lawsuits against New York and California public health laws arguing that stronger COVID restrictions on areas of worship constituted arbitrary measures. Now, on the opposite side of this regulatory coin, we find oppressive laws. These are laws that ignore significant and relevant variables separating different groups. Everyone has to get a vaccine. Are you an immunocompromised 95-year-old? Well, you should have voted for the other guy. Equality. Now, if you're scratching your head right now and asking yourself, gee, that, that certainly describes a vaccine mandate pretty well, you're not wrong. But enter the asterisk, the most powerful tool for lawmakers to cover their butts. You have to wear a mask indoors, except if you have this, this, or this health condition. We're just going to tack on an extra five asterisks to every blanket regulation and, you know, play it safe. In this case, the Massachusetts vaccine mandate didn't mandate everyone got a vaccine. Instead, it was up to local public health officials to judge who was healthy enough for vaccination and who wasn't. Now, this gave people local medics deemed ineligible an out. These two limitations are the guardrails separating reasonable public health laws from unreasonable ones that can be challenged in court. Now, there was one final piece to this puzzle. What if we're talking about a totally reasonable public health law, but for whatever reason, the potential plaintiff got swept into the wrong category and is facing the possibility of being forced to endure something terrible? Can they sue? Yes. The Supreme Court carved out standing in the case of an adult who was embraced by the mere words of an act, but yet to subject him to vaccination in a particular condition of his health or body would be cruel and inhumane. So after all that and reviewing this standard that they had just created, the Supreme Court found that, first, vaccine mandates are a legitimate public health measure. Second, the way that Massachusetts in particular had implemented their vaccine mandate was reasonable. And lastly, that Henning Jacobson would not suffer inhumane consequences because of his mandate vaccine consumption. Long story short, 
Massachusetts was allowed to keep their vaccine mandate on the books, and Henning Jacobson was forced to pay that $5 fine. Still no vaccination, but hey, at least Massachusetts got their beak wet in the process. In conclusion, this is not me advocating for a vaccine mandate. But if a politician says that mandatory vaccines are unconstitutional, well, the people whose job it is to analyze and apply the constitution would beg to differ. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, feels good to be back at my home again. Thank you to my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, click on that link in the description. Like, subscribe, and do all that other fun YouTube stuff. And lastly, as always, thank you for watching.